Chelsea's River residents have come out in their numbers to assist in the search for missing three-year-old Courtney Peter. Police yesterday extended their search to this area. Her mother, Juanita, has made a desperate plea for a safe return. That person who had my baby, just please, please bring her back to me. That person don't have to be scared. But all I'm asking, just bring her back to me. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here if you are new. Last week we spoke about the Aviwe Jam Jam case and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here for you. But today we are talking about a case that is incredibly unforgiving and if you have seen the Sasha Lee Crip case you'll know exactly what I mean by unforgiving. But for today's horrific case we are going to talk about Courtney Peters. But just like before this case is incredibly descriptive and graphic. So I just want to give that warning before we head into this case. So just please keep that in mind, but that's enough for me, and let's get into this case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today's case takes place in Elsie's River, which is situated in the Western Cape of South Africa. And Courtney Peters was born in Elsie's River on the 4th of September, 2017. Courtney Peters had a mom named Juanita Peters, and she also had a father named Aaron. And Juanita and Aaron were not legally married, but they lived together for decades. And both Aaron and Juanita had four children, and two of their older children no longer lived in the house with them anymore. But they did have two younger children, which was a younger boy, and also Courtney, who was their baby. So as I mentioned before, Aaron and Juanita lived in a house together. And on this plot of land where they lived, right in front was a Wendy house, which they converted into a bedroom. And in this bedroom lived Aaron's niece, and she stayed in here with her two children. Then behind the main house was another like small living quarters with just a bed and a TV in, and that's where a man named Mortimer Sanders lived. And Mortimer Sanders was around 40 years old at the time. Mortimer did work at the waterfront at the time, and he was a help desk consultant. And just as a side note, because there was the main house and these two living quarters in front and the back of the house, there was no toilet in the Wendy house or in the living quarters at the back. So everyone on this property would share one bathroom, which was inside the main house on the top floor. And basically the house would be constantly unlocked because people would need to go in and out. And, you know, when time calls, you need to go. So they would have to keep the doors unlocked all the time. And there were constantly people in and out of the main house. But as a general rule, Aaron would constantly have people and family friends over all the time to his house. So there were constantly people around the area and around the house and it was kind of a place where people would just come and just talk and just hang out. And because Aaron's niece at the time was unemployed, she would stay in the Wendy house, remember? And Juanita would pay Aaron's niece to look after Courtney and her older brother. But sometimes money was a bit tight and Juanita didn't have money to give to Aaron's niece to babysit. So Juanita would just leave her son and Courtney at home alone. And because she figured that there were always people in and out of the house, she wouldn't necessarily need to. But she would always make sure that if she had money, she would pay Aaron's niece to look after the children. And also with regards to Mortimer at the back, he would have, like I said, a TV in his room. And he also had DSTV, which is awesome for children because then they can watch cartoons that are not on normal SABC channels. And Mortimer often wouldn't mind children coming into his room and just watching a TV because he knew that he was the only guy in the closest area that had DSTV, so he was fine with children just coming to watch, and that was the norm. Then on Thursday the 4th of May 2017, Juanita and Aaron got up really early for work, and they would head out early as well because they would catch public transport and they didn't want to be late for work. So Aaron left first, and then Juanita just stayed a little bit just to make sure that she kind of woke the kids up, gave them a kiss, and made sure that she could prepare breakfast for them when they woke up properly. But on Thursday the 4th of May, Juanita didn't have any money left over in order to give Aaron's niece to babysit. So she just left the children in the house and she knew that they would be okay because there were people around all the time. So a little bit of time passes by and Mortimer actually gets up now and he needs the bathroom. So he heads out of his little living quarters at the back of the house and then heads into the main house to go to the toilet there. He's then done with his business and he then heads out of the house back to his living quarters. But what he didn't notice is that Courtney was now up and she decided to follow Mortimer back to his house because she wanted to watch DSTV. And remember I said that this was common for them to go into his room to watch TV because they wanted the cartoons and Mortimer most of the time wouldn't care. 
But in this particular morning, it was still quite early and Mortimer was really annoyed and he just wanted to sleep and he didn't want Courtney in the house. He was like, go away, come back later and you can come watch cartoons then. So Courtney, being a toddler, she like mm, has a little hissy fit, then walks back to the house and children don't really know what later means. And she did come back later, but around 20 minutes to half an hour later, she then wakes up Mortimer to tell him that she wants to watch TV. So leave that image in your head, Courtney trying to wake up Mortimer and Mortimer getting really, really annoyed with Courtney. Now, at the same time that this is happening, Aaron's niece, who was staying in the Wendy house in the front of the house, had just woken up and she was then waking up her, remember she had two children, she was waking up one of them in order to get her ready for school. She then gets her child ready for school, heads off the property and then comes back. She then checks on her second child and then she wakes up her second child and takes her into the main house to use the bathroom. And as Aaron's niece walks into the house, she notices that only one of Uranita's children are in the lounge and it's Courtney's brother and he's busy watching TV. So Aaron's niece kind of looks over to him and she's like, oh, where's Courtney? And he says that she's at Mortimer's house watching cartoons. So Aaron's niece is like, okay, cool. She finishes with her child in the bathroom. They're busy doing their thing. And then they head back to the Wendy house where she then sorts out the rest of her stuff from there. Then Aaron's niece notices that time's kind of ticking and she hasn't heard Courtney. She hasn't heard any noise from the young girl. And she kind of gets a bit nervous and she walks back into the house and she asks Courtney's brother again, where's Courtney? Courtney's brother then says she still hasn't come back in. So Aaron's niece then starts calling for Courtney in the garden outside. So remember I said to kind of put a pin in it where Mortimer was getting more and more angry at Courtney. So these two incidences of Aaron's niece and Mortimer getting angrier at Courtney was kind of happening simultaneously. And basically at the same time that Aaron's niece left the house to go and drop off her daughter at school, this is what was happening with Mortimer and Courtney. So Mortimer was getting more and more agitated with Courtney and he was saying, go away, I'm trying to sleep. And she kept on persisting and eventually he flipped at Courtney. And he basically said to himself, you know what? She wants to keep going on like this. I'm going to teach her a lesson. So what does he do? He walks over to his little cupboard that he has in his little room and he takes out ant poison. He then takes a couple of spoonfuls, puts it in a glass of water, mixes it around and it's like, here Courtney, drink it. Courtney then absolutely hates the taste and she spits it out. But you know, sometimes kids just don't like react very instantly. And before she actually spat it out, she was drinking and she took a few gulps before she realized that this tastes absolutely horrible. And unfortunately, those few gulps were already in her system. So not even a few minutes go by and Courtney starts getting really, really sick. She starts saying things that are not making sense and then eventually she passes out on Mortimer's bed. Now at the same time that she passed out was the same time now that Aaron's niece started calling Courtney's name. So we kind of caught up now. So Mortimer now starts to panic because Courtney's in and out of consciousness on his bed and obviously it's going to look not only because what he actually did but to someone coming in they're going to see a young child on just on his bed. So he didn't want Courtney making any potential noise so he then takes a face cloth or a small towel and he starts stuffing it into her mouth. He then puts his hand over her mouth and nose and suffocates her. He then takes Courtney's motionless body, puts her in a black bag and then like kind of stuffs her in the corner of the room where he then puts random things on top of her that were just lying in the bedroom. And then he like steps back, he has a look, he's like, okay, you can't see her. And at the same time, he then hears Aaron's niece walking around to his front door and he kind of steps to the front door and he's like, oh, you're looking for Courtney? And she's like, yes, did you not hear me shouting for her? And he's like, oh no, she walked back into the house like just a few minutes ago. And Aaron's niece kind of like looks him up and she's like, yeah, but I swear I didn't see them in the house. And he's like, no, no, I'm sure they were in the house. So then she kind of looks at Mortimer and just leaves and she goes back into her Wendy house. And if things could not get any worse, they do. And Mortimer Sanders then decides, oh, well, Courtney's body's there. And he then picks her up. He then takes his black bag off of her, puts her on his bed, and then proceeds to have his way with her. So remember now Aaron's niece was back in the Wendy house where she was looking after her child. And around an hour goes by and she says she still hasn't heard from Courtney. She's going to go back into the house and have a look. So Aaron's niece goes back into the main house and she only sees Courtney's brother watching TV still. 
and she says to him, where is Courtney? I thought she was back in the house. And Courtney's brother says, no, she never came back into the house. So Aaron's niece is kind of getting a little bit flustered. She's not completely stressed yet, but she kind of tells Courtney's brother, okay, can you just go next door? Have a look at all the neighbors' houses, and this is where she usually plays, so maybe she went there and didn't tell anybody. So then Aaron's niece goes back into her house because she still needs to look after her baby. So while this is all happening, Aaron's niece is in the Wendy house, which is the front of the property, and Mortimer is at the back of the house behind the main house. So while this is all happening, he notices that no one is really around. So he decided that now is the time to act, and now is the time to do something. He now wraps Courtney back up into the plastic bag, he then tries to put her into like this tiny little duffel bag. And Courtney is only three years old at the time. So she was tiny firstly, but this bag was smaller than her. So he couldn't get her body in perfectly to like zip it up. So he had to kind of hit her and push her into different positions in order to get her into this bag. And once the coast was clear, he then took this bag and he then headed off to Epping Industrial. Mortimer Sanders then slowly walks between two large storage warehouses where he stops just before the train tracks because he looks like he's getting a bit tired. The package that he's holding is clearly getting very heavy. Mortimer then goes behind some train tracks and removes Courtney from the duffel bag she's in, takes her out of the plastic bags and then hides her under a tree and then tries to put some random debris and dirt over her in order to try and conceal her body. Mortimer then leaves her and clearly walks back home, a little shaken up but after that he seems to get over it and just casually walks back home. Yuanita then arrives later that afternoon and her son then comes running out of the house and he says, Mommy, Mommy, Courtney's not here, she's missing, no one's seen her the entire day. Yuanita, just after a long day of work, is absolutely heartbroken, distraught. There's instant tears coming out of her face, instant panic, and she starts running to every neighbor, screaming Courtney's name, and nobody's seen her. Because of all of the shouting and screaming, a lot of neighbors come out of their houses and now everyone is looking for Courtney and everyone is trying to help find this young girl. Around 7 to 8 p.m. it's pitch black outside and no one can see Courtney so they then decide to head over to the police where they now put out an Amber Alert, a missing persons report for Courtney Peters. A lot of search parties were going around and people couldn't find Courtney for a couple of days and days and days were going by and Courtney's mom was just getting absolutely Distraught. Then on the 13th of May 2017, while there was still a search party going around the areas, a young woman who was part of the search party looking for Courtney stumbles across a very small body and she realizes instantly that this is Courtney Peters. Courtney's then taken to a morgue where an autopsy and toxicology is actually done on her body. And the only reason that a toxicology report was done was because someone leaked to the police that they should look at her blood just in case anything was given to her before her death. And this wasn't Mortimer who said this, so I don't know who did, but someone tipped off to the police that they should do that. And the findings of this toxicology report was actually incredibly disturbing, as well as her autopsy. And the findings of the toxicology report said that she had so much poison in her body so many days after she was found that this amount of poison could have killed an adult almost a couple of minutes after they had drank it. And the doctor who did the toxicology report said that that is how much poison she had that many days after she had passed away. So he thought that if you had to go back in time to the day that she actually was reported missing, if they had taken a blood sample then, Imagine the amount of poison that she had had in her body then. The doctors also confirmed that if Courtney had been left just taking the poison, she would have passed away from the poison. But they did find that the actual cause of death was strangulation. They found a lot of bruising on her jaw area, her neck area, as well as her body. And sadly, they did find a lot of trauma to her private area as well. So a lot of police and community members were highly affected by this case because this was an incredibly young child that was horrifically taken and the police hit the ground running and they noticed that when they were looking at the crime scene, one police officer was kind of just looking up and he was like, oh, there's actually cameras in this area. Why don't we try and have a look and see if we can find anything on them? And lo and behold, they found the footage that I showed you earlier. And they sent this footage around to the public because they thought someone must know this person in the footage and eventually someone did come forward and it was actually a childhood friend of Mortimer's at the time who came forward to spill the beans that he knew 
100% fact that that was Mortimer Sanders. So because this was the only person of interest that they had now in this case, the police went the next day to Mortimer's house with the South African canine unit. And as soon as the dogs were put on the property, these dogs bolted it straight for Mortimer's room. So police did arrest Mortimer Sanders on suspicion of murder for Courtney Peters and he was then taken to the police station to be interrogated and he was there for a couple of hours and eventually after these couple of hours he did confess to everything and I find it quite interesting that everything that he had done to Courtney, the only thing that he tried to defend himself on religiously was that he only had his way with her after she had passed away. And that was the only thing that he cared about getting his word out about. Mortimer Saunders was given two life sentences for the murder of Courtney Peters. Including the degree, the extent of violence used, the, the cruelty of the attack, the nature and character of the victim. The offense was planned and not committed at the spur of the moment. Lack of remorse, abu abuse of trust, abuse of a defenseless child and prevalence of crimes committed serve as aggravating factors in this case. In addition, the accused was assessed by was assessed to be a potential risk to the weak and vulnerable as he did not accept full responsibility for his actions. In conclusion, the accused is sentenced as follows number one, in respect of count one, that is rape, the accused is sentenced to life imprisonment. Number two, in respect of murder, the accused is sentenced to life imprisonment. The two sentences are ordered to run consecutively. That's the end of the judgment. And that is the horrifically tragic case of Courtney Peters. I do hope that everyone is staying safe out there. Don't forget, do not talk to strangers. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.